Good afternoon, students. Um, so today, let us consider the last topic in uh, induction motors. Uh, that is starting of induction motors. Starting of induction motors starting of induction motors in a sense why do we need a starter even though a three phase induction motor is capable of starting on its own in the sense it's a self starting motor right uh, in spite of being self starting in nature however in real world uh, the induction motors are not started directly. Induction motors are started with the help of an auxiliary device called starter. Starter. So using a starter. of starter is due to the following two reasons. The first reason is that the induction motor um, normally gives low starting torque. So why? The question is why we need a Starter. So, starter is required to address the following two problems. The first problem is low starting torque, and the second problem is high starting current. High starting current, and this high starting current is also called as inverse current. Okay. Now, low starting point. First, let me come to the first point, low starting point. Now, in induction motor, there are two types, squirrel cage induction motor and slip ring induction motor. First, let us look at the most widely used induction motor, which is squirrel cage induction motor. Now, in case of squirrel cage induction motor, um, while explaining the constructional aspect, I have stressed on one particular point, that is the fixed resistance of rotor. Fixed resistance of rotor. Now, in case of squirrel cage induction motor, the rotor resistance is fixed because Rotor bars are permanently short circuited uh, by means of end rings. Okay. If you give me one minute of time, I can show you a squirrel cage rotor. So I should be thankful to my colleague, uh, Professor Nagraj. So Professor Nagraj actually constructed a 3D model of squirrel cage rotor. So this is how the squirrel cage rotor in reality looks like. Right? You can clearly observe that the rotor bars are not parallel to shaft axis. The rotor bars are skewed with respect to the shaft. Okay, And you can see how this rotor is permanently short circuited by means of the two end rings. So there is no provision to add or alter the resistance of this squirrel cage rotor. Right? Hence you can say that it's a fixed resistance rotor. 
I hope now you will be able to appreciate the fact that a spiral cage rotor is a fixed resistance rotor because you cannot change the resistance by altering the rotor uh, conductor, right? So fixed resistance rotor and this rotor is made up of copper. This rotor is made up of copper and copper has low resistance. A high grade copper is having very low resistance. And your starting torque TSC is kind of proportional to the rotor resistance RR. Okay, so rotor resistance, okay, RR is rotor resistance. So, this expression basically uh, explains the problem itself. Starting resistance is proportional to rotor resistance, and rotor resistance is fixed, and it is also having a very low value, due to which you can say that T starting is very low owing to lower resistance value, and you will not be able to change this resistance. So this is one of the reasons why we need a start. Okay. Now, in case of spirit cage induction motor, you cannot change the resistance. You cannot change the resistance unless uh, you provide an additional cage, you know, which surrounds the uh, given cage. So in high level uh, machine design, uh, to address this uh, fixed resistance problem, uh, what we can do is we can go for an additional cage. So additional cage as in uh, you will have two cages. Okay. You can imagine that uh, this is your inner cage and the pen is your inner cage and this is your outer cage. So by making use of a double cage rotor, uh, you will be able to increase the rotor resistance. By increasing the rotor resistance, you can slightly improve the starting torque. This is one way of you know addressing the low starting torque problem in case of squirrel cage induction motor. Of course, there is a trade-off, uh, and the trade-off is the efficiency. So when you increase the rotor resistance, what will happen? I, I square R loss uh, will be generated in the rotor, and due to the increased power loss, the efficiency of the machine can come down. So that is the first problem, that is the low starting torque. On the other hand, if we go for a slip ring induction motor, okay, slip ring induction motor, in case of slip ring induction motor, resistance can be varied, can be varied, right? So since rotor resistance, okay, resistance can be varied as in rotor resistance. So if you can vary the rotor resistance, you will be able to achieve a very high starting torque. So that's the reason during starting, resistance is kept in maximum position in case of slippery induction motor. On the other hand, during running, this resistance is kept in minimum position. So, a slip ring induction motor doesn't require a starter. A slip ring induction motor has a built in starter, which is also called as rotor resistance starter. So, by adjusting the resistance value between maximum and minimum, you know, you can achieve the desired outcome, whether to, I mean, whether to go for high starting torque or not whether to get higher efficiency. All right, fine. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you don't have to have any starter for slip ring induction motor simply because it has a resistance starter inbuilt. Okay. So whatever starter discussion we are carrying out uh, is with respect to a screwing cage induction motor. All right. So, so far we looked at um, Problem number one, that is low starting torque. And we also discuss uh, about how to overcome this low starting torque. Either you can go for a double cage rotor 
or you can go for a slippery road. Right? So this is done, low starting point. Next up, we have high starting current. Okay. Now, what makes the induction motor to draw a um, very high current at the instant of starting? Now, what happens is that at the instant of starting, or at start, at start, the rotor speed is zero, right? When your induction motor is at rest and when you are about to start an induction motor, you can say that the rotor speed is zero. So when rotor speed is zero, the slip of the induction motor, that is LR minus LS divided by LS is one. So slip is unity. Due to which the rotor induced EMF ER is actually slip times the stator voltage ES. Since slip is one, what you get is ER is equal to ES. And what is ES? ES is supply voltage. Supply voltage. For example, let's say over 40 volts. Over 40 volts. Okay. Now, due to this very high voltage at the instant of starting, the starting current IST can be simply calculated as, um, let's say, um, IST is equal to, um, say, V starting divided by rotor resistance, RR. So V starting is nothing but ES, and RR is the rotor resistance of the rotor, which is very low because it is made up of copper. Um, let's say just um, 2 ohm. So what is that you are getting? Voltage as something like 440. Okay, you can even take a, a per phase value, uh, 440 divided by root 3. Okay. Root 3, okay. So that will be somewhere about um, 240 volts, roughly 240 volts divided by 2. So how much current you are getting? Uh, 120 amperes. So your starting current is as high as 120 amperes. However, however, if we look at a typical induction motor which is working at 440 volts of supply, will have I rated somewhere about 15 amperes. So the rated current of the machine is about 15 amperes. But how much is it drawing at the instant of starting? It is drawing about 120 amperes of current. So this is called as inrush current or high starting current. So this problem is quite common in all the motors, induction motor as well as in the DC motor. So due to this high inrush current, what happens is that, so this high inrush current creates two types of problems. The high inrush current or high starting current causes two types of problems. Problem number one is that it creates it creates sudden shock in shaft. It creates sudden shock, uh, sudden shock in shaft. Sudden shock in the sense it's something like, you know, um, let's say you are sitting on a two-wheeler bike and we'll start the ignition and all of a sudden, if you give the accelerator, what will happen? Uh, the vehicle may topple, right? So the same thing happens with your uh, electric motor. All of a sudden, if the motor is subjected to high uh, current, the motor, what will happen is, you know, it just quickly accelerates. So that quick acceleration creates kind of shock in the shaft uh, part. So due to which, you know, shaft, you know, may bend. Due to large mechanical forces, the shaft may develop some kind of, you know, uh, bent uh, uh, phenomenon. Okay. So once the shaft is bent, there is uh, no way of uh, going back unless or otherwise you replace that particular shaft with a 
liver shaft, which is very, very expensive. So to create or to avoid uh, the unnecessary uh, mechanical failure uh, in induction motor, it is necessary to limit the high starting current in an induction motor. So that's the uh, first uh, adverse effect of high starting current. It creates sudden shock in shaft. The second adverse effect is looked in uh, looked at uh, electrical uh, angle. Okay, looked in electrical angle in the sense uh, when there is sudden inrush of current, there will be fluctuations. Fluctuations in supply lines. Supply lines. Um, sometimes uh, we have observed these uh, voltage fluctuations in uh, uh, our homes, right? Um, the lamps will go, you know, dim and bright um, alternating, right? So that's because of uh, the high interest current. So the indication is that uh, nearby, uh, near, near to your home, some person must have started an induction motor directly by connecting it to uh, the three-phase AC supply. So if you connect an induction motor directly to three-phase AC supply, the motor will drop very nice supply lines, which is highly objectionable because due to fluctuations, the uh, life cycle of a particular electrical appliance or equipment uh, may reduce. Okay, so that's the reason you know it makes sense to reduce this starting current. Okay, and by reducing this uh, starting current, you know these two problems can be avoided. Okay, now how to reduce the starting current? You can go for a device called starter. Hope now you are clear about why a starter is required to avoid mechanical shock and to avoid uh, unnecessary voltage fluctuations in supply mains. Now, in induction motor, we have different types of uh, starters. Right. So, for slipping induction motor, you don't need any external starter because you have the rotor resistance. So, that's the reason your slipping induction motor is also called as rotor resistance you know, starter motor. So, it has an inbuilt uh, facility to vary the resistance. By varying the resistance, you can reduce the current because if resistance is set high, current can be limited and you can also achieve a high starting. On the other hand, for squiddle gauge induction motor, there are different types of uh, starters. Okay. Uh, you have auto transformer starter, state or voltage control. You have state of resistance, so and so. So the list is quite uh, exhaustive, but we will not be studying, uh, you know, all about these uh, starters. We'll be studying about only a specific starter. Okay, only one starter we'll be studying in basic electrical engineering. That is star delta star. Star delta star. Now, why star delta? Why not others? Simply because you have understood the star and delta connection. Okay. So all the other starters are uh, studied in uh, your higher sensors. Okay. Fine. So next, let us look at the construction and working of a star delta star. Okay. So construction. Let me write. So in exam, six to or six to eight marks, they can ask this particular question. Construction, construction and working of star delta star. Okay. It's pretty simple. Three phase line R Y. 
थ्री फेज बाइंडिंग It's a PPSD switch. So in the bottom half, you will have a uh, second TPSD switch, TPDD switch, triple pole, double pole, which will establish the desired start delta connection. So this particular switch um, can be operated in the upward direction as well as in the downward direction. It can be operated in um, two different types, either upward direction or the downward direction. So this uh, straight line which connects first contact to third contact simply says that all the three contacts are moving in unison. Okay, so they move together. Um, the first switch is TPSC. Switch triple pole single throw. Single throw in the sense it can energize only one single circle, that is the upper half of the circle. On the other hand, the lower switch, whatever you have, it is called as TPDT switch. So this TPDT is nothing but triple pole double throw. Double throw in the sense it can energize the upper half of the circuit or it can energize the lower half of the circuit. So it can um, assume two different uh, positions. Hence, uh, it is called as double throw. All right. So, yeah, the remaining connections. Connected here, and then you have the second one. It is connected to the center terminal, and then you have the third. The third one is connected to the last terminal. Yes. So basically, the YD gets connected either in star map, you can see that, right? A common node you have created in the downward direction. So this is your star connection and the opposite one gives you delta connection. Delta. The star connection is also called as start position. Why I will tell you. And the delta connection is also called as run position. Run position. So this is the three phase AC sub. This is in which this is your state. Okay. This is your state. 
and rotor is will be so this is your circuit and this is the connection diagram connection diagram is pretty simple three phase ac supply is connected to three phase ac wind that is the state of wind so the state of winding is connected through the first tpst switch so you can see that each ends of the state of winding is connected to r y and v w so that means to say the three phase winding state of winding is energized by a three phase ac supply the other ends of the winding that is this end this end and this end is connected to a tpdt switch so this tpdt switch what it does is it either establishes the star connection okay if it is put in the downward direction or it establishes the delta connection if it is put in the upward uh, direction now in star connection what happens is that um, the line voltage okay if let's say vm is the line voltage okay so this is your line voltage. So three phase AC supply. You can say that it is line voltage. So in star connection, in star connection, what happens is that the windings gets connected in star, right? In star connection, the windings gets connected in star. Due to which each winding will receive a voltage called as V phase, which is just one by root three times the line voltage. For example, if your line voltage were to be let's say 440 volts, so the phase voltage will be around 239.6 volts. So basically, what you are doing here is that you are Applying a reduced voltage, which is one by root three times the line voltage. Right? At a reduced voltage, okay. At a reduced voltage. At a reduced voltage. Starting current IST gets reduced. If voltage is less, current drawn by the circuit will be less. If the voltage is more, current drawn by the circuit will also be more. So at this reduced voltage, IST. Will be less. This is what you want, right? To uh, uh, mitigate uh, the starting current. So, by starting an induction motor, by connect connecting its uh, state or winding in star map, a reduced voltage can be applied. At this reduced voltage, the current drawn by the induction motor will also be uh, less. Due to which the motor motor runs you know, at a lower speed or motor runs slow. Once the high starting current problem you have reduced, you can change over to delta connection because in delta connection line voltage is equal to phase voltage due to which the motor will receive uh, vl is equal to v phase is equal to 440 volts due to which the motor can run to its rated speed so this is how uh, an induction motor can be safely started using a star delta start so star connection or start and uh, delta connection here let me write Delta connection is for run. Under delta connection, what happens? Line voltage is equal to phase voltage, and which is equal to let's say 440 volts. So this will give you n is equal to n rate. What is n? N is nothing but speed. All right. So this is the operation of star delta. Star. 
will start at the start. Okay. You can say that um, the starting talk is about the starting talk is about one third of um, full load talk due to reduced voltage. Obviously, the starting torque will also be reduced, but that's okay. Anyhow, these uh, spirit engine motors are used for low power applications. So, with the reduced voltage, the starting uh, torque becomes, you know, uh, equal to only one third of uh, full load torque. If your full load torque is 10 newton meters, then your starting torque will be 10 by 3 newton meters. That is 3.3 newton meters. Okay. Though it gives a lesser starting torque, but it can greatly uh, helps in uh, reducing the starting current. So that's the working of uh, start and uh, start. So that completes the theoretical aspects of induction machine. Star delta star. So let me solve one or two problems, okay, and uh, we can conclude the uh, session. So that's it from induction. So today's discussion was why starter is required and the operation of starter. Okay. Take a problem. Take a problem. Right. A 12 pole three phase. I think it's a seventh problem that we are solving. A 12 pole three phase 50 hertz alternator. Twelve pole three phase 50 hertz alternator. Is driven by is driven by a 440 volt three phase 60 pole six pole induction motor is driven by a 440 volt three phase six pole induction motor. Induction motor running at a slip of three percent. Running at a slip of three percent. Fine, fine, fine. The frequency of induced DM generated by the alternator. Fine. The frequency of induced DM generated. By the alternator. So basically, you are supposed to find F of alternator, the frequency of induced DMF of alternator. How will you solve? So you have to read the problem first. It says the induction motor is driving the alternator, right? So induction motor is directly connected to the alternator. So probably you can draw the following setup. This is your alternator. The alternator is driven by an induction motor. This is your induction motor, IM. So, for induction motor, okay, this is your induction motor. So, for induction motor, they have given slip is 3% and number of poles as 6.
And for the induction motor, they have also told the frequency is 50 hertz. I forgot to mention that. For induction motor, they have given the frequency of operation as 50 hertz. So what you have to do is you have to find F for alternator. For alternator, F is given as Pn divided by 120. Okay. Or rather, Pns uh, divided by 120. So you are supposed to find out Ns. If you know Ns, um, you will be able to find the F. Now, Ns of alternate is equal to N of induction mode. Right. The speed of alternator is called as the synchronous speed. And the speed of induction motor is called as the rotor speed. So if you can find the rotor speed, you can say that you have found the synchronous speed of uh, alternator. So first let us find synchronous speed of synchronous speed of induction mode. What is synchronous speed? Ns is equal to 1 by F by P. So Ns is equal to 120 into F is 50 divided by P is 6. So it is yeah, P is equal to 6. So it is uh, 1000 RP. Once the synchronous speed is obtained, you can find out the N because we know the slip value, which is 3%. So N R can be found as 1 minus slip into N S or 1 minus slip. Slip is 3%. So that is. 0 0.03 into 1000. So that's that gives NR is equal to 970 RPM. So once you have NR, okay, you can find the alternator speed. So F is equal to P for alternator, number of poles are 12 into Ns. What is Ns? Ns of alternator is Nr of induction motor, that is 97 divided by 120. So basically the alternator speed you will get it as 97 hertz. It's a very important oh. 97 hertz. So 